So how many of you work uh, in a data-driven organization? Pretty much everybody, okay, that's great. Uh, are you having to juggle between creating infrastructure, ingest pipelines, and analyzing data? And you have trouble allocating time because each one is important. So today I'll share our experience leveraging Flink, Kafka, and other technologies to build a multi-tenant stream processing platform <laughs> to handle and process data at scale. So I'm Manal Dakshini, and I lead the cloud platform team of an amazing set of engineers, some of them who are here at uh, Netflix, to work on stream processing. So today's talk, I'll present it in layers. We'll start from the top, and we'll peel lay one layer at a time to progressively see what's underneath the hood of our ingest pipeline and our stream processing as a service offering. We'll look at use cases, and uh, our decisions along the way will reflect uh, the lessons we've learned. So let's start with the ingest pipeline. If you have a lot of events and you're not able to reliable, reliably publish them, then there's no use of having those events, because if you're dropping them, then you, you've lost your insight that you could have had. So having a really reliable ingest pipeline is, is a key uh, service and forms the backbone of any real-time data infrastructure. So our pipeline's built on uh, three core subsystems. The first one is the Keystone messaging service. This is built on Kafka at the core, which acts as a persistent buffer uh, between the producers and stream consumers so that we can easily recover from failures. The next piece of the component is the stream processing platform itself. And the third one is our uh, very critical management layer. It helps us manage all the services we have, provides a very easy to use interface to our users, and helps us scale without having to add a lot of warm bodies to our, to our uh, team. And uh, the Keystone pipeline leverages all these three subsystems and is built on top of these. So let's take a quick look at how one goes about using the system at Netflix. So a user can come in and start creating a new data stream. They specify uh, basic information like who the owner is, what do they want to use the stream for, so if you have a better idea when you want to get back in touch with them. And they can select the region and the environment in which they want to create the stream. So here they're creating a new stream in, in test in US East region. They're specifying what the data rate is going to be. And they're saying it's going to be about 12 megabytes a second. That's an initial estimate. It can change. And we adapt to that when it changes. So now they've created uh, kind of the first part of the data stream, that is, a data stream is nothing but a mini pipeline, and this first step actually ends up creating a topic in Kafka. When we are done, done with this and click on Save. Now we are adding an output. So when your events flow into your system, they go into Kafka, and then you have to decide where's, what's the destination for this event once you've processed it. And that's what we're adding right now. We're saying we want all these events to end up in a Hive uh, database, and we have integrations with it. You'll see we have a couple of options uh, for deployment. One is the low latency, you'll see, and the other one is min duplicates. What this means is when we are revving our code, when we are redeploying the job, we want to make sure that we adhere to those SLAs. We can either start a brand new job at the same time uh, so that there's low latency, but you have some amount of duplicates, or we can completely stop the old job and start the new job in which case you have low duplicates, but now you've introduced latency in processing your job. So we support both because we have both kind of uh, requirements. And now we're going to add a filter. And this is going to create a separate path or, or separate mini pipeline, also called a data stream. The filter expression is our own in-house built XPath expression. Uh, we're looking at enhancing in the future. But right now, it lets you select uh, which fields you want. You can do equality comparisons. Uh, you can do mod, and there are a few more other functionalities that are available out of the box. 
So in this case, I'm saying uh, only send events that has an app field in it and where the value is hosted. And that's the only, those are the only events that are gonna make it to uh, the destination that we're gonna just configure. The other, the other pipeline that you see here, this one is already configured to go to high. So this will get the unadulterated, full-fledged set of events. The other one is gonna get only a partial view of it because you have specified a filter there. And we specify a few different things, Hive, Kafka, and, and Elasticsearch. So here we are specifying a separate table because we don't want both those events to land up in the same Hive table. And again, we search what kind of uh, SLA we want in this. In this case, we want min latency. The other one, we chose uh, min duplicates. So there we have our streams provisioned. Um, and a few minutes later, uh, the user is ready to start producing their events into the pipeline. So they went from nothing to having created a, a Kafka topic, uh, a set of jobs uh, were launched with the right filter specified in it, and as soon as you start producing data, they land up in, in the appropriate destination. Now I made a small error. I forgot to update, update the filter. So you could actually go back and update a filter. What's that gonna do is it's gonna stop the jobs uh, or it's gonna launch a new job based on the strategy you chose to deployment and uh, it's gonna update the filter and, and get the jobs, new jobs running again. So here's another example of uh, a filter. And this is a made up one. And here uh, we see that there's an R conditional uh, using two different fields in, in the payload. And on the left, you'll see something interesting. It's the message parser type, so we support different payloads and the kind of serialization we use so they can choose which one uh, they're expecting to see. So this example shows how we are configuring a couple other things, an Elasticsearch sync and key to which is the Kafka sync. So you see that there's a 4x fan out here and they could be as high as a 9x or a 10x fan out of the events flowing in. So this is an example of what a user can configure for an elastic search thing. They can specify the index, uh, they can specify what the index type is, what are the ID fields, and uh, what the rollover is. Is it daily, weekly, or monthly? And we automatically take care of rolling those indexes for them. Now there's another feature we support, it's called projection. So again, uh, filter projection, they all create separate data streams, so you have an extra fan out. Uh, we are looking at optimizing that in the future when you have a lot of them working on the same stream, how do we reduce the fan out? Uh, but that's something we haven't gotten to yet. So here we're creating uh, and adding a new projection and we're gonna send all these events to Hive as well. We're gonna create a, specify a different table name and specify a certain strategy that you wanna use and this projection picks up one field. So in this case, there's a, this is incomplete, but it's basically say include fields equals and you specify the fields in your payload. And depending on the message type you specified, it knows how to parse the payload and pick the right uh, event out of it. So this will send events that only have that field in it. So for example, let's say you're sending user events and you say, I only want user's ID and the number of clicks. So it's gonna parse the payload, extract those fields, and send only those forward. So in addition to creating uh, the pipeline, it also creates an automatic dashboard for every single stream that flows through our system. So you can see what's being produced into, how we are doing processing it, do we have any lags in the system, and are we keeping up with that? Do we have any errors? So it's a quick view for our users to see what's happening with their data stream. We've also built some interesting set of tooling to go along with this. Because we need more insights into what's happening. 
So here we are taking a look at one data stream that we have configured that goes to Elasticsearch. As you can see, we have links to a dashboard, which we just took a look at. So this is the dashboard for that stream. And then next we'll look at our uh, CI CD deployment tooling that this goes to. So we can go and see what's happening from, uh, from a deployment perspective. We also have a link to, sorry, the video just restarted, okay. So we also have a link to the Flink UI, which is the job manager UI. So you can see exactly what's happening. In this case, we have a single job that's running uh, two job managers and uh, <coughs> it's doing the routing to Elasticsearch. So if you click on the job that's running, this is the stock um, Flink UI that comes out of the box and it shows us that there's one operator chain basically running on each task manager and in each task. So it gives our users very easy access to all these important pieces of uh, the infrastructure that's running. So if there are issues, it's very easy for them to debug and see what's happening. So we, we also have something called uh, aggregation of logs. So we take all the logs from these jobs that are running and actually pipe them to another Elasticsearch instance. So we do log aggregation, so it's easy to search when you have errors in your system. And uh, we also have an option to uh, specify a boost factor. Let's say you have a certain surge in traffic and it's within a certain threshold and you want to quickly react to it. Um, we have an option while operating the system to quickly boost it so that we can la launch more number of task managers to deal with the uh, traffic. We also have a way to externally scale the system, uh, but sometimes you have to override if you want quick react reactionary response to uh, large surges in traffic. Uh, the tooling also has a couple of uh, neat reports built in, so we can see if there are any inactive uh, streams in the system, uh, so we can deprecate them. Or if there are any under-provisioned systems that we know about, so we can proactively take action as well. So this happens when the user says, I only, I'm only going to produce 12 megabytes a second, but it ends up happening that they end up producing hundreds of megabytes a second. And this helps us um, detect that early on, uh, if you look at the reports and, and respond to it. We still have alerts and configurations that set up uh, to let us know as well. So now we'll uh, peel the first layer and explore a little bit deeper inside how the event flow and what the capabilities of stream processing, uh, sorry, of the ingest pipeline are. So the red system boundary indicates the edges of the Keystone ingest pipeline. Everything outside it is not managed by it. It's either a source or a destination. Uh, in this scenario, we have uh, thousands of producers. Uh, so pretty much every application in Netflix ends up producing events into our system. And uh, we have built a Kafka wrapper and the reason we did that is we want to integrate in nicely into the Netflix ecosystem, into our metrics and monitoring system. And uh, the way we also tune the producer library is we prefer availability of the producers because we don't want any outages on our streaming, in our streaming system or the ingest pipeline affecting a user's ability, a member's ability to stream videos. Uh, so we take a lot of care in making sure we don't impact uh, that. And the system is also designed uh, in a way that we are not in the line of path for streaming videos, so that if our system's down, um, our members can continue enjoying our catalog. So the events at an event producer can either use the library or they can directly use the uh, proxy layer to send events into the fronting Kafka cluster. We have a whole uh, mini set of fronting Kafka clusters, and all the events end up in here. So this acts as the first 
uh, layer of persistent buffer between the producers and our stream processing system. And the next piece of the component is the router. This is the one that uh, pulls Kafka for messages, applies the filters and projection, and uh, sends the data along its way to Hive, Elasticsearch, or uh, consumer Kafka clusters. It deals with the outages upstream as well as downstream, and it's pretty resilient and robust. It runs on a container runtime, so if it crashes, it gets resurrected up again and it starts working. So currently we have, uh, we are using this Flink uh, based router for routing events to Elasticsearch and, and consumer Kafka clusters. We don't yet use it for uh, S3, but we are in the way of testing it and then uh, moving it over so that we can replace SAMSA with Flink infrastructure. Now another key thing to notice here is we have isolated set of clusters here and here. So you may ask, why not allow users who are stream consumers here directly feed off of here? Now, as we've seen, there could be a very high fan out, and we don't control how many users could tag on here uh, very easily. So we do this intentionally to um, sort of quarantine these set of clusters so that only we can consume from it, because we know how we are consuming it from it. We know our own patterns, so we can keep this very highly available so that we don't drop uh, data as much. And we also have functionality in our producer library so that we can buffer more data in memory in the producer. So if you notice over time that certain applications are producing a lot of events and uh, they might feel the back pressure, then we occasionally go and tune the buffers here automatically for them so that they can have a little bit larger buffer. So instead of having a fixed buffer for all the producers, uh, we tweak them uh, if they are very large producers of events. And that's done automatically in a, in a cron style job. So some of the key capabilities of the pipeline are that it tries to achieve at least once delivery semantics. Uh, at Netflix, we jokingly call it at most at least once because there are certain failure scenarios where we actually don't get all the events out of the system. Uh, data stream isolation is key. Every path of events that you saw flowing from event producer to the sync needs to be isolated from the other path because you don't want uh, delays in a certain partition or a source Kafka cluster or uh, failures in a downstream sync impacting the other path. So we explicitly keep them completely isolated uh, so that uh, CPU usage or memory pressure doesn't impact on our job. We also inject a few certain fields to help us uh, detect the events and detect duplicates. Uh, and also uh, we inject timestamp for event time-based processing and to see where the uh, events came from. For lineage, we also add host and app information in there. So another critical uh, SLA for us is to keep the data loss less than 1% per stream for the whole day, uh, especially when we are doing infrastructure upgrades and migration and, and doing deployments. Uh, so this is a very critical need for us because we process over 1.3 petabytes every day. So it's, it's not a small amount of data we're dealing with here every day. And uh, it's a huge undertaking because our business host stakeholders kind of rely on this data. And most of these events actually end up in Hive, which is used for reporting. So all these mini pipelines that we're building, the routers infrastructure, the Kafka. So for the router infrastructure especially, we have um, an external system uh, that we can trigger to scale it up or down. And we look at the existing traffic and a historical traffic to see what the new projected capacity needs to be for that specific uh, path. And uh, because we have higher SLAs to meet, meet, we also have to make sure our system is pretty reliable, especially not losing data. And our fronting Kafka cluster is key. So uh, being able to fail over a Kafka cluster in, in uh, case of emergency is very critical to us. So we realized this early on when we had actually failure and uh, our cl Kafka clusters went down and we had data loss. So since then we um, took the Kafka Kong approach so this is inspired by the whole Simeon Army, Chaos Kong, Chaos Monkey, family of monkeys that we have. 
And uh, we want to keep our system, our system has to be up 24-7, and critical piece is the, uh, the persistent buffer in the front where we receive the events. So we intentionally introduce uh, and simulate failures on our Kafka cluster, um, and we try to do it at least once a week if we can. Um, so that we know that in case of a real failure, we're actually able to recover. And well, what we've noticed is sometimes when we lapse and we come back to doing this, we discover some issue that would have prevented us from actually doing a failover if one were to really occur. So this has been a very useful exercise for us. So what happens is when we simulate, simulate a fronting Kafka failure, we tell all the producers to start producing to a different cluster. So we control it by a set of dynamic properties. The new Kafka cluster that gets brought up, all the topics get, gets copied over, uh, and we launch another set of uh, routing cluster, sorry, Flink routers. The reason we do that is we still want to try and attempt uh, to drain the older system uh, so that if there are still events stuck in the older friendly Kafka cluster, we can process them. And all this failure is, again, uh, automated. Uh, we can pick which cluster we want to fail over. And uh, with a single button, we can fail it over and run that whole thing that you saw again. And not only that, once we are done, we can actually revert back to the original Kafka cluster with another button click. And it happens as fast as about five minutes in certain scenarios. So now it's time to peel the second layer and look underneath the hood of what the stream processing as a service actually is doing and how the routers are built on top of it. So the stream processing service um, enables the point and click pipeline that you just saw uh, by allowing us to write the routing jobs. And it also allows us to write custom jobs. So Flink's currently used for uh, these two kind of broad use cases within SPAS. Uh, we have plans for creating a DSL to make it even easier for our users to create jobs, but uh, that's something we're looking to do in the future. So at the highest level, just to recap, uh, you already saw this in the uh, animation of the screencast earlier, is the user can create the jobs, they submit it to our uh, management portal, the UI, or they can submit a DSO, which isn't there here yet. It gets deployed to our uh, continuous deployment delivery tooling. You may be familiar, it's called Spinnaker. And eventually these end up on our container runtime system called uh, Titus. So this is how, how our stack kind of currently looks like. It's abstracted out a little bit. So on the most bottom layer, we have uh, AWS EC2 instances. On top of that, we have a container runtime environment called Titus. And on top of that, we built a SPAS core uh, using Flink. And uh, we create a few reusable components. A few of them you saw were the sinks. You could automatically use the Elasticsearch, Hive, and Kafka sinks to send events. And we also have uh, a sync to kind of loop back and send events into, into Keystone. So that's useful for uh, right now for scenarios where we don't have very capable syncs, but we still want to route it through our existing Keystone system. So it's, it's a stopgap right now until we build them and make them more better. And on top of this, we have the, um, the ingest pipeline routers, the flink jobs that actually route events from the events to the producers to the syncs. And then we have custom stream processing applications that I'll talk about in a second. Um, across this tooling, you know, we have integrations into our metrics and monitoring. You looked at some of the dashboards we generate uh, and the management service UI layer. So currently the UI you saw supports creating these uh, point and click pipelines. And uh, we are working uh, on, we'll be working on supporting the stream processing application as a first class citizen as well. And we also have plans to support with this platform other, other engines at uh, Netflix that are in use. So this is how a job actually looks when it's deployed on a container runtime. Uh, we run in a high availability mode, so we choose small, two small containers to run two job managers for us. And uh, we run a Zookeeper cluster. So we have one Zookeeper cluster for all the jobs that are running. And uh, the task managers uh, each get deployed on uh, a container of its own. And uh, periodically, we save checkpoints uh, to S3. And 
we save the offsets back to fructin Kafka cluster. I'll give you a little more detail about how we moved from this to a little more evolved system to deal with scale and, uh, and other issues in a bit. So digging even further in, this is like the fourth layer of the cake, you see that the whole Flink-based stream processing infrastructure is running here. And there's a whole big ecosystem around to get our container runtime running. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, Titus, we have uh, presentations by uh, another team at Netflix that manages and runs this infrastructure. So please feel free to look online. Uh, it's pretty interesting how it works. So now we'll get into the use cases um, and uh, some of the challenges that we faced. And we'll, I'll limit it with uh, the lessons we have learned as well. So the first one that we saw was the Keystone Pipeline Router. Uh, this is an example of a massively parallel use case. Uh, you know, every data stream is independent and isolated. There are no dependencies between tasks within a certain job. So for example, Every router is a separate job. It's reading from a set of partitions, and every job reads from only one and only one topic. And if your partitions are assigned to different tasks in the task manager, each one of them is independent because you're not joining data, you're just taking the events, processing them, and sending it out the stream. And the operator, as you see here, gets chained. Uh, this is a screenshot from the job manager UI. And for this specific use case, uh, it's, the parallelism is 248. And it's reading from a source, filtering it, and sending the data to a sync. And in this scenario, what we want to do, but want, what we actually end up doing is we only uh, checkpoint the state to Kafka. So uh, each Flink job reads from one topic, and each task independently pulls from the partitions that are assigned to it. And we don't use Kafka's um, automatic consumer group assignment. We use the uh, manual assignment that's built into Flink. This kind of helps us avoid a few problems. Uh, one of them, uh, if, you, if you know about it, is in Kafka, the current in the current Kafka version in 09, the polling is piggy uh, sorry, the heartbeat is piggybacked on the polling. So if you take longer to process before you poll, then you could lose membership in that group, and then you could get dropped off. Your partition could get assigned to another consumer, and then you have to get back in and get reassigned. So it causes a bit of churn. Um, this way we don't have to worry about that scenario. So when we say massively parallel, what does it really mean? Uh, we process over 1.3 trillion uh, events every single day. And uh, there's three petabytes of data that's coming in and nine petabytes of data that's flowing out. Um, at least this year, we, would, we used to have much more higher availability, but re with our recent numbers, we have about two nines of uh, availability of the whole system. We've seen a huge uptrend in the events that are flowing into our system. We started about at around 80 billion, uh, like around a year and a half, two, about two years ago. And currently we are at over 1.3 trillion. So it's a, it's a real hawkistic increase in the number of events we are seeing. So we, uh, <clears throat> currently only the Kafka and the Elastic Search routers are deployed in production. Uh, the routers that actually send data to Hive um, are still running SAMHSA and we're running Flink in test, and we're testing it. So the numbers below don't account for the S3 uh, deployments in production. It's only for the Kafka and Elasticsearch sync. So we have 4,000 plus brokers uh, running in 50 clusters. We have hundreds of data streams, and uh, we have you know, over 3,700 Docker containers running those routers. Um, it's built on Flink, and uh, this goes across 1,400 plus nodes and uh, that have 22,000 CPU cores in it. So it's a pretty parallel and uh, massive scale application. So 
So the router has large scale, not only in terms of volume, uh, but also the overall deployed number of streams in the cloud. And especially when you're running in the cloud at this scale, it leads to uh, unique challenges that go otherwise unnoticed in different environments or at different scale. So some of the, some of the issues that we run into, the biggest one was the S3 checkpointing backend. Um, when there was an S3 outage, uh, we had a downtime. But when we were using SAMSA, which didn't use an S3 backend, but only committed offsets to Kafka, there's no issue. Uh, the other thing we noticed is if you deployed everything at the same time, it put a lot of pressure on S3. Uh, and uh, we had some throttling from back from S3. We, we, we experienced some back pressure. So it led to lags in our system and, and a lot more uh, you know, pages for it. So the one trick that we did is we um, we configured the task managers to not take the snapshots, but have the actual job manager uh, buffer them for a while, and then it only writes to S3. So that way we reduce the number of concurrent clients writing to S3. Uh, the other scenario that impacts this use case is if there is a failure in the task, so you have several tasks running across several task managers. If one of the tasks fail, then the whole job gets restarted. The, the whole process doesn't start, but the job gets restarted. Uh, so it takes about a second or so to do the restart. However, what this means is it could lead to uh, more duplicates than SAMHSA. Uh, the reason for that being all the partitions are processed independently. And uh, during a certain failure, some of the partitions might revert back and start at an earlier point in time. And so you'll have more duplicates. So in this scenario, let's say a task manager goes down, the whole job restarts. Whatever uh, task manager on host one and two were doing, we have to go back to the previous checkpoint. Versus if you're only able to restart uh, the container that's running in host three, and let the other ones continue running and recover, then we could reduce the number of duplicates. And I think this is an effort currently uh, pursued under the uh, fine-grained recovery umbrella. Uh, so we saw uh, significant cost savings when we moved from uh, SAMSA to Flink, uh, enough to get us really excited. Uh, however, um, if you run similar tests, you may not see the same results. Uh, because your environment may be different, your setup is different, and your use case is different. And besides, this is not an exactly uh, apples to apples comparison because we actually moved uh, and uh, replaced a runtime that was on SAMSA and a different container runtime to Flink and a different container runtime. However, if we normalize it, we still see uh, significant savings. So the next interesting use case is being able to enrich video plays uh, with additional attributes using Flink. So the challenges here are we want to talk to live services. Uh, we want to integrate well with the Netflix's uh, IPC ecosystem so that we can invoke these services and use the clients that are provided today. Uh, it needs high throughput. Uh, it does have small state, um, and uh, it's about 100 million events a day. So the challenges with this use case are, um, how do we effectively access these uh, external services, whether it's slow changing data or fast changing data from a live service or a static source? How do we play uh, nice with the other live services? So whenever you're hitting other live services and you're doing processing at scale, you put undue pressure on that system. But we want to play nice so that we don't bring down that service and inadvertently impact our ability to stream movies. Uh, the other big one is dependency isolation. Um, using clients from other services to call their services means you're bringing in more jars. Uh, you're bringing in more dependencies. And uh, this significantly you know, causes what everybody may know, uh, a, j a jar hell problem. Right? And you want to deal with it. So the last use case is the complex socialization of user events. Uh, so Flink out of the box supports session windows with a gap duration, uh, but we wanted something more for this use case. In this use case, our session uh, start and end event markers are uh, based on what's inside the payload, 
right? And it's also based on uh, the time those events occur. So you could have a couple of different events that qualify as start events, and you have to pick the one that's the earliest. Um, and so uh, we also want to handle late data and out of order events. These sessions end up being anywhere from two to 24 hours. Uh, so the state that's held is pretty large. We have about, uh, you know, we expect about 10 billion events um, in this use case. So currently we are playing around and testing um, in a staging environment with prod data with a very limited volume a very small fraction of the volume. And even then, the state that we end up uh, having to manage is uh, you know, 100 plus gigabytes. So when we do deploy this at full scale, you can imagine how big uh, the state could get. So uh, to deal with our specific sessionization case, uh, we developed our own uh, custom complex session windowing. And we're currently uh, working uh, together with the community and data artisans to figure out uh, a way to solve the large state and large scale uh, issue. A, a couple of things that would help along this uh, case is being able to do quick checkpoints. Because currently what happens is the whole state gets checkpointed every time. It's not what's changed, but what the current state. So that means every few uh, minutes when we have our checkpointing interval, uh, we end up checkpointing you know, hundreds of gigabytes of data. So incremental checkpointing will help uh, alleviate that uh, first step of the problem so that we can only checkpoint what's changed and not the whole world. Uh, we're also looking at other strategies uh, that we can use to uh, make this problem much more bearable so that we can recover really fast uh, in case of failures. So what we've realized uh, with these three use cases, the massively parallel router use case, the enrichment of events, and complex sessionization is that if you're able to solve these problems, we could meet a lot of uh, uh, the needs uh, and uh, requirements from our stakeholders that use our platform. And most of these users are other engineers within Netflix. So in addition to uh, the challenges that we saw for, for every use case, we also have challenges that span across all these cases. Uh, one of them being developer tooling and testing. We want our developers to be able to quickly start a job locally on their laptop, be able to test it, and be able to quickly push it through test and prod without having to worry a lot about the infrastructure, the tooling, the uh, build systems. We want to provide them out of the box uh, metrics and monitoring and operational support. Uh, we want them to provide deployment functionality so that they can have continuity through their upgrades and deployments so that uh, they can continue where they left off in the stream processing uh, and be able to maintain state, especially when you have large state, you, wanna, you don't want to recreate all that state from beginning and create huge pressure on your upstream systems and upstream Kafka clusters. Uh, the other critical one is tooling around uh, data parity in Canary. Uh, what I mean by that is when you have updates to your code, or let's say you're launching a new job to be in parity with your bad job. How do you make sure what you've created especially when you have critical state that you are passing downstream that you haven't broken anything. So you need uh, great tooling to be able to compare those two streams, the old and the new, and see uh, if there are any anomalies or issues with it. So having tooling around there is, is very critical. The other challenge we've seen is thinking stream first. Uh, when you're coming more from a batch background, how do you think about a problem in streaming? How do you help your customers to think in a different way? And it also brings along a whole set of other challenges, uh, you know, like operational challenges. What part of this functionality am I responsible for? What part of the functionality is the infrastructure team going to take care of? And how do I delineate those? Uh, now it's a 24-7 system, so what do I do if there's an outage uh, compared to a bad system? So there are a lot of uh, uh, those kind of logistical challenges as well. Uh, how do we effectively do you know, cross-region aggregation and routing without having to move all the data across? So we have so much data, it really doesn't make sense uh, you know, economically as well to kind of have all the data everywhere. And the last one is how do we uh, achieve auto-scaling? And today we said we have scaling, but it's external. It's not uh, true auto-scaling. And how do we automatically predict and project capacity? So if you have a very large 
uh, use case with very large state, when they come to us and say, I want to launch this, how do we determine what that initial capacity is? How do we increase that capacity based on the traffic that flows in and increases over time? So these are a whole uh, set of challenges that we are, you know, some of them we haven't even scratched the surface on it and we're actively looking to uh, solve this uh, in the long run. So look at uh, how we are contributing back uh, to the community. So having uh, worked initially with Flink, uh, I think the number one thing we do is we are running Flink at scale in the cloud, which by itself um, shows the um, gaps or issues that we may run into. Uh, so we have contributed towards getting uh, metrics improved, uh, the operations improved, uh, the way it gets deployed. Uh, the custom session windowing that we mentioned uh, is available. Hopefully at some point in time we'll open source that uh, to uh, benefit the community. Uh, improving fault tolerance, uh, working with the community to uh, improve the large state management support uh, and work with data artists on that. Uh, we had some unique challenges when uh, we were trying to get the massively parallel code base and our interaction with S3. So there was a patch that uh, one of the engineers on the team submitted, which was adapted and, and uh, added back to Flink. Uh, so over the period of time, you're hoping that we'll be able to uh, collaborate more and contribute more back. So today you got a glimpse of how we are leveraging Flink uh, as part of our uh, stream processing platform. We want to serve our business needs and the needs of other engineers at Netflix. Uh, we've come a long way, however, we've just begun uh, the journey in our quest for fast data. If you're on a similar journey and uh, would like to collaborate with us or with the Flink community, uh, we'd like to hear more from you. Thank you.